I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, we're talking today about a book that you've edited that's just been published called Our Growths Were Once People, Stories of Death and Dying. Um, I know that you just got your hard copy. Do you mind showing us what it looks like? <laughs> yeah, so it uh, looks like this. Can you see? Nice. Yeah. Yay. Exciting. Um, could we start at the very beginning and could you tell me what prompted this project and also where the title comes from? Uh, firstly, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, yeah, for inviting me to do this and yeah, for taking the time to do this as well. So thank you. And then um, to answer your two questions, I think the first question is probably has a, has a long and convoluted answer, but I'll try and be, I'll try and be brief. And I think like the major seed for this project is um, the, the tragic death of Uyunene in 2019. Because um, I live in, and for people who don't know this, I, I live in Rondebosch, uh, Cape Town, which is close to the University of Cape, uh, which is close to the University of Cape Town. And I think she had gone missing on a Saturday. She went missing on Saturday. And I just remember sort of like in that week, the number of posters that kind of went up across like Rondebosch Main Road in particular, uh, along shop fronts and just the posters that went up. And because I wasn't part of uh, the university community, I was just pretty much uh, an, an outsider. But I remember seeing those posters because they were so, they were everywhere and just this feeling that uh, this is not the kind of story, this is not the kind of South African story that always has a good ending. And just subsequently what happened to her and the kind of grief that, uh, it was if the detail, everything about that story is so shocking. And then just the kind of grief that I think people felt nationally, like was like, um, I suppose that was the, I think the seed for this project in many ways, because I think part of what it means to live in this place is that we're always in a, constant conversation with grief like even the last month is like the events of the last month are, is yeah. proof of that we're constantly in a conversation with grief and so what does it mean to think through uh, something like that um, mm. and then the second thing is about the title which is it comes from uh, a memoir by an American writer called Jasmine Watt um, she has a memoir titled Men We Reaped which is about the death of uh, five young black men who were close to her, including her brother. All of them died at a very young age. And the argument she's making in that book is that the system is, this is politics, is, deter is what determines which, which lives, uh, which people yeah. get to live and who gets to die, who gets to die prematurely. And so in the, I think in the introduction to that book, she says something like, um, so I might misquote, but she says something like, uh, saying this is difficult is an understatement. This is the this is one of the hardest things uh, I've ever had to do. But my ghosts were once people, and I cannot forget that. It's such a haunting kind of uh, phrase. So that's mm. where the title comes from. This book, so it's a collection of essays, fiction, photos, poetry, all on the subject of of death and grief. And what makes this collection remarkable for me is that every single contribution is a unique contribution. Um, and then together it creates this sort of kaleidoscopic picture of, of death and of grief, um, which to me means that it was very well curated and very thoughtfully curated. So I'm very interested to know what went into that process. How did you decide, how did you find the pieces that ended up in the book? Um, how did you decide what to include? Oh, sure, thank you. Thank you so much firstly for, for the kind words. And uh, I think also, I feel like I have a backstory for every question, which is, and for me, one of the things is like, I, I ever since I was maybe like in my late teens or early twenties, I've loved literary journals. Like I've absolutely, even to this day, I absolutely love literary journals. And one of the things that they do, or most literary journals work on the principle that um, there's a theme and the different writers or artists or photographers kind of like explode that theme to the, to the very limits so I've always like I've I've just I love that feeling and so in a way that's to say 
and even like I guess even on my desk I've got a book here called Hair which came out a couple of years back which mm. works on the same principles that different writers are just told write something on here and by the very fact that all of us are different people we're going to come back with different responses even though the, the, um, the I was going to say the trigger or the uh, the the prompt is the same. So the same thing happened here. Is this is just that everybody just because by virtue of them all being different people, everybody came back with different interpretations of death, how mm-hmm. they'd experience it, how they feel about it, and and all of that. And then it just became a in conversation with uh, the publisher that I've been working with, any Olivier at Jonathan Ball. Once the material was there, just how do you cluster it? How do you put it all together so that that reading experience is Again, this is all from reading also literary journals, just that mm. uh, you just, you get, yeah, multiple experiences and multiple interpretations of the same theme. Mm. It does have, it does sort of have the feel of a literary journal when, when reading it, like a more substantial literary journal, just, you know, because it's a, it's a full book. Um, but some of the pieces, some of the pieces were published before, right, elsewhere, and then some of them were written for this collection. Yeah, um, so I would say so 80% of the book is, is new writing, so 80, 85%. And then there are other sort of like 15 piece, 15% of pieces that existed, yeah, that were published elsewhere. And so, it, again, I guess this reaches back to your earlier question about curate, about putting it all together. In a way, sort of like there are some pieces that uh, I had come across years back, and they somehow seemed to like would, yeah, would either... Uh, would fit really well with uh, like up against a new piece or that's exploring a particular subject. So that was how that process kind of worked. So this project, it originated before the pandemic, um, but then during the process of, of, of writing and putting it together, that was the, the pandemic happened during that process. So I wanted to know how did the pandemic affect that process and also how did it affect your reading of the pieces and your experience of putting it together? Oh, sure. Um, thank you for that question. I'm, I think I'm. I'm going to try to be. I'm going to try and be as honest as possible. I think um, what happened is we had to just decided to push everything back by months. Push mm. everything back by months because this was before the pandemic, and so the pandemic. I think I. I remember. Uh, I'm getting distracted now, but I remember years ago reading a review of Philip Roth's book Nemesis by J.M. Kutsia. And Kutsia, it was in the New York Review of Books, and one of the things Kutsia says there is that, because it's also a book about a pandemic, but this is years back, about the polio pandemic, and one of the things Kutsia says is that uh, the pandemic is almost like a... uh, I'm going to misquote again, please forgive me, this uh, a heightened condition of being mortal is sort of like what comes because mm. people perish so quickly. So it becomes like a yeah. heightened condition of being mortal. And so uh, just to come back again, like I think like a lot of people, like I was struggling to get my head around what was happening. It was just on the one hand, it's also so frightening, also an uncertain time. And it's difficult to write from that moment. So everything mm. got pushed back by by months, like deadlines I'd started with got pushed back uh, just to give everybody time to like regather and think. And so I guess one of the things about reading the pieces that it became, for me, it felt a lot more urgent and a lot more timely mm-hmm. because this was a conversation all of us were having because, yeah, this was a conversation that all of us were having. So it just, yeah, it was just a real blessing to be able to uh, to work on these pieces at this particular time. Mm. Yeah, th- I, it definitely affects the reading experience. I think it's, I mean, it's so, yeah, it's so much a book of the moment, especially because it is so many different stories of grief, and that's that very much reflects many of our lives right now. Where if, even if we don't have personal grief or haven't gone to, haven't experienced loss ourselves, we're just surrounded by by people who are going through this. Um, some of the, the standout pieces for me were about, not about um, loss per se, but about sort of the range of activities that are initiated by death, like the sort of the things that happen, that kind of happen behind the scenes and we don't tend to think about um, after someone dies. 
So I was curious, um, could you tell me a bit about some of those pieces, especially any pieces that sort of surprised you or where you learned something that you didn't know before? Uh, okay, sure. Thank you again. Um, I think one of the pieces, which is an existing piece, I think I'll single out two pieces. One is by Khadija Patel, and uh, she had written it years ago. I remember reading it like five, six years ago. And like mark of good writing is that you can't get it out of your system. And yeah. you have this <laughs> thing of wanting to pass it to everybody else. <laughs> and her piece is about the... Uh, uh, bathing and shrouding of dead bodies mm. in she volunteered at a center within in, in within Islamic culture and she had volunteered and her sister had volunteered uh, at a cent, uh, at a place in, in in Johannesburg where they would wash and shroud uh, bathe and shroud uh, dead bodies before burial and it was such an intimate uh, piece and also just a piece that takes you into at least for me a world I had no idea about like just and done so beautifully and like yeah just like done so beautifully so that's one piece I think and it's just yeah it's really amazing and then a piece which is maybe uh, very different to that is Tato Monare's photo essay which is about um, the how do, you, how do you say this disputes over inheritance and because uh, so just to summarize for people who haven't uh, looked at the photo essays what happens to a family when an elder dies and um, there's no will or there's no or there's an there's a disputed will and siblings are fighting over who gets to take the house and usually the houses are then scribbled over with words like to say this house is not for sale or something like that the houses are marked by this kind of dispute and I had never really paid attention to that and so Tato Monara really just kind of goes through these and just documents these houses Mm. And it's just, yeah, for me, that was stuff like that has just been like really wonderful to not really wonderful, but uh, what's another word for wonderful? Moving, They're illuminating, very moving pieces. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I also, I also found those two pieces really moving. Um, and then another one that stood out to me, sort of in that category, was Madeleine Foulard's piece about um, working for the National Prosecuting Authority and finding. The, the bones and the bodies of people who had been killed during apartheid and whose bodies hadn't been identified or found yet. And how like the sort of race against, um, well, time, but also, you know, different physical conditions, like how those things are like the enemy of memory and preservation, like preserving stories. I thought that was, that piece was also incredible. Oh, like also like just really, really, really incredible. And just to say as well, like, I'm just filled with so much uh, gratitude for all of the people that participated in this project and like just to get back to Madeline's piece it's for me like uh, I don't I'm sure it's the same for you like I I, I knew about the work that they did but I didn't mm. know it to that kind of granular detail like at that mm. level of detail about these are the things that even you're talking about time like because it's the, the essay is in three pieces time paper bone about even the mm. documents um, that are being lost in this kind of race to kind of uh, find all of these uh, disappeared people. Like, I think it's, yeah, it's extraordinary and very moving as well, yeah. but also yeah. very educational. Yeah. Yeah, and there's all, just all these beautiful, unexpected pieces of writing. Um, Gongani, before we finish, I just, in your introduction, you referred to reading as a small good thing in a time like this, in a time of excessive grief and um, so I wanted to know if you have any suggestions of books that one can find solace in oh sure okay uh, so I'm going to recommend two books I think uh, just off the top of my head um, the one is because I've spoken I'd spoken about it earlier is Jasmine Ward's memoir men mm. we reaped I uh, just think it it's a book that has so many resonances with this place that we our shared space South Africa I think has so many resonances it will yeah it will resonate with so many people here mm. and maybe the second book is slightly odd because it's 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 on my desk uh is um uh father's field and it is um an account of of three indian soldiers during world war ii uh it's it's written by uh, a young man about his great uncles 
although he never met either of them, they existed as photographs at Fort and in, in World War Two. It's also a really moving book mm. um, about how do you write history in the absence of yeah, so many so much material. Thanks, Mogani. And I, this collection is a standout collection for me this year. Um, so thoughtfully curated, so timely. It's a book that I will recommend to, to anyone who I think needs it, which will be many people. Um, so thank you for talking to me and thank you for this book. No, thank you, Fasti. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, much love to you and everybody else. Thank you.